Welcome back to another episode of Off the Top Podcast. I appreciate you guys listening. I know I've been really appreciating the email saying of how good looking I am. Um, at least that's what I sound like on the podcast. Uh, this is me, Jordan. What's up? It's Julian. I find it interesting that uh, our emails are comparing voices to faces and my face hasn't been compared yet. Yeah. And also, so today we have a pretty cool podcast and we're going to be talking about event planning and then also a little bit about weddings. And today we have a guest. Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Shannon. And so, Shannon, we're talking about event planning and wedding planning, like I just said. Why why do we have you on today? Like, what is your expertise in? Um, specifically, I deal with weddings, but I also do um, events. I love to do big events. Um, my favorite is charities and organizations trying to raise money. Um, but I also have dabbled into little events, too, like engagement parties, bridal showers. So we're just going to talk about all that fun stuff. Very cool. Um, so my first question is, when you think of event planning, wedding planning, um, kind of the whole skew of things that are going on in today's society with, you know, gender reveals and all this stuff, what kind of drew you to the career path of event and wedding planning? Um, well, I just love bringing people together. Um, so any excuse where you can, you know, get everybody together and have some food and drinks, I just think is a fun time. So I love that. Nowadays, um, our society is kind of branching out to gender reveals um, or just like different approaches to getting everybody together. And so is that something you said that you naturally have a predilection for bringing people together? Is that how you kind of like, did you know that? And so you just jumped into event planning knowing that that was your thing? Or was it more of like a stumbling upon it? Like explain that journey a little bit. Definitely. So I feel like I've always had um, an eye for design um, and like party planning. I'm super organized naturally. Um, So yeah, so I definitely wanted to go into it as a career. Um, It took a little while to get me to that point. Um, But now that I'm here, I know that that's like my destiny to do this for a living. I think um, it's interesting too in today's, I guess, world, you'd say with event planning, wedding planning, like I feel there's more added pressure on event and wedding planners in the past just due to the fact of social media and like everyone's always wants to one up someone else or share, you know, make these photos great, et cetera. Do you feel in kind of the steps to event planning, there's a lot of different checks and balances you kind of make sure with your client to have exactly what they want or do you do a lot of like, um, I guess, offering like you know maybe we should go this route with this or maybe we should go this route for kind of what you're trying to do definitely i think that's a big part in being an event planner um is helping guide your clients um to giving them what they want but also being realistic um because especially with nowadays with pinterest and instagram um it's really easy to get wild with all of these dreams that you want for your big day or for your event and realistically sometimes that just can't happen so um as an event planner you're there to help guide them to give them their dream day very nice so it seems like you're almost like uh, shepherding uh, their ideas and how they would like the event to go that's very cool. Um, so just out of curiosity, when like let's step in the shoes of Shannon right now as an event planner, what are some of the most common events that you end up doing? Um, well, the most common is weddings, for sure. Um, I feel like that's when most people want to spend the money to hire an event planner is for weddings because that's such a big part of their life. Um, and then same with like big fundraisers as well. Um, Just to have somebody that can be there to help coordinate um, and get all the vendors together so everybody's on the same page. It just makes the process so much smoother. Um, So a few days ago, Jordan and I were talking on the side of weddings. What are some of the big ticket items um, that people kind of put a lot of their money towards or have like little to no like boundaries on? Is it like elaborate flower displays, the cake? What is it that you find? Honestly, the most shocking expense that people don't think about is food. Food and alcohol is probably like the biggest um, money spenders. um, And that will kind of drive a lot of like your guest count. um, And same with venue too. It's um, kind of crazy how expensive venues can be. Um, But I would say majority of your money is going to go towards food. 
Jordan, what um, in your wedding one day? What is the what do you have on the menu for food for you? Um, for me, that's a very good question, and I think that would depend on you know exactly where I am in my life. I would hope that it would be either something that's just you know very logical and common sense filled or something that's just like what the hell is this you don't think you'd have like a snack table of all of your favorite i mean as as me being kind of and this is new to my podcasters or the listeners um i'm a big snack guy and uh i almost embody you know there's part of my name people know me as a certain snack guy (laughs) so I think that possibly there would be some sort of snacks going on just to be true to my roots. What? I'm not sure yet, but when the time comes, I'm sure that people will be amazed. So what are some of the kind of estranged or odd foods you've had or um, just kind of like, I guess, cakes or whatever in that food or alcohol? What are some weird things that have come up? Like maybe it's meatloaf or something along those lines. Um, I feel like the weirdest, um, is fish. I don't, I've had some clients that have just gotten like actually whole fish, um, especially like in, um, like Jewish weddings or like Greek weddings, they literally will fry like whole fish and just have them lined up in the buffet. And that Mm. is so unappetizing to me, but that's part of their culture. So, um, but yeah, if you're not used to that culture. Um, that's kind of odd. <laughs> so what what would be the very middle of the road? Let's say that there's a listener out there that's thinking about starting their wedding or like starting planning their wedding. And they're like, I don't even know, you know, where I should be going, what kind of food I should get, like all that stuff. If you can kind of give them some sort of base roots blueprint, how would you start with that? So I feel like the first and most important is um, finding your venue Um, Because a lot of venues offer catering, Um, a lot of venues um, offer like tables and chairs and linens, so that's going to really set the tone for your budget and to your guest count. Because I mean, if you're planning on having a 300 person guest count, that's going to really eliminate a lot of venues for you. Um, So that's probably the first thing that you should book because at the same time, a lot of the other vendors are going to want to know where they're setting up at. Or they're going to want to know the space, so how many like flowers to bring in, or where is the DJ going to set up. So the venue is probably the foundation to your big day. What are some venue nightmares that you've encountered or heard of in you know the event planning, wedding planning community? The biggest is just outdoors, um, especially um, on like the West Coast area because. Uh, You never know if it's going to be 120 degrees or if it's going to be raining. Um, I've had weddings where literally, yeah, it's, you know, 110 degrees one weekend and the next weekend it rains out. Um, And so a lot of people don't think of having a plan B and that's just super important. And same with the smoke too. If there's like a lot of fires going on, a lot of people don't take into consideration that um, smoke can totally ruin a wedding. Gotcha. So, I mean, I think that just presses upon the importance of, you know, first off, before you even get a vendor or like a a venue, that is, make sure you have the right date. So, you know, what kind of weather you want, if you want like pretty autumn leaves in the background and like, you know, that dusky fall ish kind of feel, then, you know, obviously plan it sooner to, you know, October or November. But if you're looking for like a nice, bright, you know, like shiny or sunny wedding that is like you do like june in the summertime definitely and so have do you find a lot of people wanting winter weddings i feel like that that's the trend right now is actually moving into fall winter weddings uh i think a lot of it has to do with uh a a lot of venues offer discounts because it's off season technically um so they'll usually give you you know a couple thousand dollars off the venue And that way, too, you don't really have to come up with a plan B if it's an indoor uh, reception and ceremony. Um, So the kind of stress of, oh, is it going to be too hot or is it going to rain out? Um, It's kind of gone. And two, I think as far as uh, trend goes for colors for weddings, um, darker colors are coming in. And so that usually like resembles fall and winter. So that's kind of the direction uh, weddings are going in right now. Um, you hit a real key word that I like to hear in the terms of uh, weddings, and that was discount. What are some uh, 
what are some tips and tricks on haggling um, during your wedding? Or do people not do that because I'm a haggler? Oh, no, people for sure haggle. And I definitely recommend it. Um, a lot of venues, if you say that you have a budget, um, they will work with you to try to fit that budget. So um, having a budget going in and um, trying to see um, if you can get them to lower it is great. Uh, two, if they offer catering and they allow you to bring in outside catering, doing it yourself, you know, just going to like Costco and getting some tri-tips or something like that is a really easy way to save money. And um, same with as far as alcohol goes, that's another huge expense. So um, being able to be creative, um, maybe going to like a bulk liquor store and buying your own liquor and having like a friend that has a liquor license serve, um, that's a really good idea. Or just not having hard liquor at all and just doing beer and wine. That's also a really like creative way to cut down costs. Very cool. So it seems like there's a lot of uh, ways that you can get creative when planning your wedding. We kind of covered uh, food and we kind of covered venues. Um, is there anything else that like, you know, are there any other pillars to weddings, you know, as far as, you know, is our DJs crazy important? Are, you know, flowers the thing? Are, you know... The wedding photographer. The... Yeah, I mean, I definitely feel like you get what you pay for. Um, so that's like a huge thing. Um, but it just kind of depends on what you're wanting, like what the vibe of your big day you want. So if you want something that's super royal and, you know, extravagant, then that's obviously going to cost more money because you're going to want more flowers or sparkles or glitter or whatever um djs are usually like the least expensive and same thing like worst case scenario you can have a friend you know put on their playlist and um, play some music so i feel like uh, music is probably the cheapest and the most easiest way to cut corners for sure yeah i feel like weddings um i always liked a good dj at a wedding i think but with the resources we have today like spotify or I have like Apple Music or Tidal or whatever you use. You could probably make a pretty nifty little playlist if you wanted to. But I think DJs are, in my opinion, DJs are kind of fun because they can mix it up. And they obviously it's their job. So they have a great variety of like old music to newer music to, you know, the rhythm and the pattern and feeling out the party. So you can't play EDM your whole wedding. <laughs> I, unless that, that's what you're into, yeah, dude. Yeah, unless that's the crown. <laughs> yeah. Imagine having a wedding at the Electric Daisy Carnival. Like, that would be <laughs> all EDM. But another thing, too, is I feel like uh, to piggyback on what Julian said, I think that DJs are also... I like to think of them as more of the masters of ceremony, uh, stands for MC. So, you know, throughout the night, they're going to get people involved and, you know, hurting people different ways, letting them know of certain timing cues of, you know, it's time to sit up, it's time to sit down, or like it's time to stand, it's time to cheer, you know, things of that nature, just because it helps to have that voice kind of directing the flow of how people react and where people go. Um, and then talking kind of on that day of side, what are some just wedding nightmares from things like, you know, maybe people forget in terms of when they're budgeting or trying to think about their wedding or maybe on the day of they're like, you know what, I don't like this. Like, what are some of those wedding, like traditional wedding nightmares that you run into every now and again? Um, the biggest thing is people not eating. I don't know what the deal is, but especially like girls when they're like getting ready um, the bridal parties, you know, tend to take, I mean, freaking six hours just to get ready and they don't think about eating. So they're just pounding mimosas all day and then, you know, getting tipsy before they're even walking down the aisle. Um, so eating is super important. Um, and I just think that like taking your time with alcohol, I think alcohol is probably the biggest like mishap that happens at weddings. Um, probably my favorite stories come from like people getting way too hammered. Um, but yeah, just kind of keeping like that all together and eating definitely helps control uh, your liquor consumption, getting too drunk. Gotcha. So it sounds like, uh, you know, people get just lost in the moment. So try to stay, you know, as present as you can, but at the mm -hmm. same time, like understand, you know, you have a full day to go. You want to eat some sort of food. Mm -hmm. um, and from my experiences of weddings, there's not a lot of time for the bride and groom to like have a sit down meal. Even when people are all eating, you're supposed to be visiting. You're supposed to be thanking people for coming and things of that nature. So just keep that in your fourth, like, you know, your forethought if you can to eat and not, you know, get too aggressive with the shots. 
And huh. the biggest thing, too, is, like, nothing goes on time. So everybody has, like, a timeline in their head. Like, I want the ceremony to start at this time and dinner to be at this time in our first dance. It never goes according to plan. Um, but that's really where, like, the event coordinator is there for to just kind of smooth all of that out. Um, and so I just recommend to, like, my bride and grooms, like, don't stress out if we're 10 minutes behind for dinner or the ceremony doesn't start exactly at 5 o'clock. Like, everything's going to happen. Um, it just may not be at the exact time that you want it to be. So where do you see the, I guess we're on weddings. Where do you see weddings in the future? Where do you see them heading towards? Do you see them staying traditional or do you see a lot more, you know, creativity or, you know, maybe more destination weddings or how do you see kind of the industry changing as time progresses? I think it's getting a lot more creative, which personally I really like um, because I think people are taking into consideration a little bit more about like what represents them. Like a lot of people want these events to showcase, okay, this is us as a couple. Um, for instance, like cake, a lot of people don't do cake anymore. They'll do other things like donuts or pie or like candy bars or, you know, like a dessert bar or something like that um, because that like represents them a little bit more than, you know, a traditional cake. Um, and I'm also seeing a lot of the traditions as far as like garter tosses or um, bouquet tosses, cake cutting, that's kind of slowly going away. Um, again, because those things don't necessarily represent the couple. So they would rather have more time to, you know, drink and dance with their friends than worry about, you know, who's going to catch the bouquet. Gotcha. That makes sense. And so you mentioned uh, how the macro scale of weddings are taking place and changing over time with, you know, uh, future iterations getting married. Do you find the role of event planners changing as well? Definitely. I definitely think that event planners are becoming like more as guides or more as like almost counselors in a sense. So just like really help navigate like what the purpose of this event is. Um, but I do think that event planners are becoming like more and more popular. I think, um, you know, back five years ago, a lot of people would just rely on their family and friends. But I think that people are realizing a little bit more that like a professional is needed. And so it's becoming more and more popular, which is great for me. Yeah. <laughs> so you uh, kind of touched on, you know, the counseling point of view, which I find it interesting um, before the podcast, we kind of talked about what your degree is in um, as opposed to what your career path is. How do you find, you know, what you have your degree in helping or being beneficial to where you're currently at as an event slash wedding planner? Yeah, so my degree is actually in psychology. Um, and so I kind of went that route before I really knew that I wanted to be an event planner. Um, but it definitely helps because I'm able to keep a pretty level head when it comes to the big day. Um, and also I'm very understanding, you know, um, we all hear that term bridezilla about how, you know, these brides freak out and get upset, which is totally understandable because it's such a stressful time in their life and they just want everything to go perfect. Um, so for me, I get to have like that point of view where I'm just very understanding and I'm in the moment and able to kind of calm them down and like realize that everything's going to be okay. So I'm definitely really fortunate that I have like that educational background to help me with that. And do you find yourself ever, you know, uh, where do you see yourself as an event planner or wedding planner in about five years? Are there skills that you can gain? Like, you know, what are the good event planners doing? What are you doing? And how, you know, how do you garner those skills? Definitely. I think that social media is like a huge presence um, in the event planning game. Um, definitely with like Pinterest and Instagram, like showcasing your, I mean, essentially it's an art form. I mean, you're showcasing like this is my creative mind mixed with the client's creative mind and this is how we piece it together so showing that um to other people and them seeing that and being inspired that this is what they want for their big day um really gets your name out there and then a lot of uh event planners dabble into all kinds of design whether it's also interior design a lot of them blog do photography um so just kind of exercising all of those skills really helps get your name out but it's definitely through like a social media presence for sure yeah i guess that makes sense social media is kind of everywhere and 
everyone wants to share what they have with everyone else. Um, Jordan, here's a question for you. If you had some wild event, I want you to lay it out and I want Shannon to give us kind of the quick steps on how to get that event going. Okay, so the event that I want to plan out right now is I want a celebration of everybody's unique skill, but also have an event of, you know, just appreciation of me. Let's say it's a going away party, but people bring things to me, not as gifts, but more of skills that they have. So what do we have going on here, Shannon? Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like what kind, like activity skills? Like, so, like so are you going to set up like a, what about like a game day? A game day? Like what if you did like a whole bunch of uh, games so you can see the skills? Like um, you could have a competition of uh, who could bring the best snacks. Um, I'm thinking more actually of, you know, a, a, a huge party. You know, there's tons of different things and it's a day party. And, you know, instead of gifts, I get to see people do interesting things. So it's not as much of a like contest, but more of a, you know, it's a big party. Nobody bring anything, but, you it's know, like there's a talent still. show. Just for me. <laughs> Just for me, though. Nobody else gets to see it, really. Then how is that a party? Well, everyone's there partying, but then it's like, you know, But then they I'm go chilling. behind like a closed curtain. Well, and... no, it's not that concealed. <laughs> I think you're misunderstanding me. How about let's just go with the, the talent show. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, that, I feel like that would be fun to do a talent show. So mm. what, what would you do to put your creativity to work to do just a phenomenal talent show? Like whatever inside tips or hidden things the general public doesn't know to just put on that America's got talent in our backyard. Well, first of all, you need to find like a Simon Cowell for sure. Somebody with a cool accent. To I be am judge. the Simon Cowell. Oh, you are. Okay. Um, yeah, I just think that you could just makeshift a stage, um, which would be super fun and super easy. You don't even have to get like an actual stage, just like a little location um, just kind of set aside. And then just get a whole bunch of chairs or benches um, and just, I feel like food is super important. Um, so just having like maybe just some appetizers and... How do you how do you think of the idea of the people that are really good at their skill get different buffet access compared to the people that aren't so great? I mean, I'm easily bribed with food, so I think that that would work. So you think it would put make people put their best foot forward or would it just upset people when they really, you know, they're bringing their skill of you know, card stacking, card castle stacking, and nobody's impressed. And then they have to eat like a pudding snack pack. I mean, at least they're getting food, so they shouldn't complain. <laughs> I think it would be fun. That would be a good idea. And I really actually like pudding snack packs. So. And then I mean, I... this, this is where my question is trying to end up. So Jordan wants to do a talent show that is six hours long. How do you put together your pricing package? Because obviously we haven't talked about it the whole time, but the event and wedding planner has to get paid, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you put your pricing package together for different events? So usually there's a few different options that people do. Um, you can do like different level of packages as far as if you just want the day of or if you want somebody to help you with design or like the whole Shazam um, a lot of event planners do it hourly, so you can buy like a package where it's like, okay, you get 15 hours of my time for $1,500, where you want to use that time is completely up to you. So do you want to use like eight of it on the day of, or do you want to use it, you know, for me to help you with design or, you know, you know, picking out linen colors, whatever it may be. Um, a lot of them charge hourly. Gotcha. And so, Julian, that was a perfect segue for what I wanted to talk about next. Shannon, I want to go over a few facts and statistics with you of specifically weddings, and I want to hear what you think. And, you know, forgive me for being a little bit morbid, but these are facts that I found quite interesting myself. Okay. So a U.S. study showed that on average, the United States weddings are about between... Um, twenty or nineteen thousand three hundred and twenty-three dollars and three three thirty-two thousand and twenty-five dollars. Is that what you normally see weddings go for, or higher, or more, or less? Um, I honestly typically see them higher. 
Um, but usually between, I would say my typical weddings that I've done are range between thirty and sixty thousand dollars. Thirty and sixty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. That's pretty interesting. And granted, there's a lot of skew. And I just mentioned the average, not the median. Mm-hmm. So basically, what happens with that, folks who aren't you know into the math. Um, there's a lot of pulling factors. So there's a lot on the top heavy side, a lot on the bottom heavy side. And so that's what pulls into that number of, you know, about 23 or 25,000. But all right, so here's another question. So, or not a question, but tell me what you think. So a study from Emory University of 3,000 adults who have been married um, from the men, or the finding was from the men that spent 2000 to $4,000 on engagement rings, were 1.3 times likely to end up divorced. What do you think about that? Um, I feel like that's really interesting. Um, I mean, I maybe they, yeah, maybe they're like feeling a little bit more insecure about the relationship, so they want to like pay more money for a ring. But from your under, like from your experience, is that a lot to spend on a ring? Is it a little, like as far as an engagement ring goes? Um, yeah, I mean, not really. Actually, I feel like that's on like the lower the lower side. Um, it's kind of like wild what like rings actually cost, but, um, but yeah, I think like the average person probably spends at least like $3,000 on a ring. Gotcha. Julian, your eyes got really big (laughs) and I'm not sure if you're about to sneeze or about to faint. What, what was going on there? I am a very, I don't know, maybe I'm a hopeless romantic. I just don't, it's hard for me to believe in (laughs) in the cost of weddings um, as time goes on. So some of these figures for me, I'm like, wow, that is a lot of money for a, a single day. Dude, I haven't even gotten to the good stuff yet. <laughs> let me let me power through. So another finding was, there was two findings, main ones, uh, women whose weddings cost, and so granted, remember that the average was 25000 okay. Women whose weddings cost more than 20000 or 20,000 or more, were 3.5 times more likely to end up divorced than women's that who spent 5,000 to 10,000. What well, do you think about that? Well, my I'm sorry to jump in. My thought there is like the lower end weddings, I feel more about the traditional relationship and love. And I feel like as you get to really expensive weddings, it's more about, you know, like this is what I've wanted since a little girl. I'm a little girl. So I finally found this dude who's going to help me get this wedding. Um, and that in the end could end up a little bit more negative than positive. That's my look. Yeah, I definitely think that. I think that um, people get like caught up in wanting to impress everybody else that they forget about like the true day and like what it's all about. So I can definitely see how that would be a statistic. Gotcha. And so, Julian, you mentioned something earlier, but I kind of want to wrap it up. What do you think of the wedding scene personally as a hopeless romantic? Uh, what do I think of the wedding scene? I think it is. I think I understand the concept. I think it's great. Like you show your true um, affection or this thing called love on this day. And, you know, you bring all your friends in and stuff like I'd rather get a pizza. Um, I just I, I think the whoever, you know, find out the way to monetize it or make it a business extremely smart for them. But like the fact that you have to get like an engagement ring and then like a wedding band is like. I don't know why you need two rings or like, I don't know why you need to pay this much for flowers, but it's a thing and it happens. And I guess I just got to suck it up over time. Yeah. I think that's basically saying girls who aren't out there just trying to stunt, find you a man like Julian. (laughs) (laughs) Shannon, what are your thoughts? Um, I mean, I think that a wedding is there for you to present yourself like as a couple and so I think that's like the most important thing whether it's you know five thousand dollars or sixty thousand dollars how you want to represent your relationship and like your love for each other should be up to you so um I definitely I mean I'm biased because I'm a wedding planner so I want them to spend as much money as possible um but at the same time like I you should have your you should have your dream day because this is going to be a day that you remember for the rest of your life yeah, whether it works out or not. Quick question, Shannon. Mm-hmm. Um, where can people find you, you know, if they wanted to learn more about you, they mm-hmm. thought you were cool, maybe they even wanted to have you plan an event, mm-hmm. where would they be able to find you? Um, well, currently I'm actually starting a new blog. Um, so you can find me um, on Instagram, 
Um, it's the runaway bride underscore. Um, and then you can also um, find me on my website, which is www.therunawaybride.me. Wow, that seems like there's a lot to unload there. The wedding planner who's also a runaway bride. Yeah, you'll find out more if you follow my blog. Yeah, so we'll have all the links in the description for her Instagram, um, her other social media, her blog, so you can check that out. Um, We'll have our email down there at the the offthetoppodcast at gmail.com. We're on all the platforms. We really hope you found this super informative or learned some new things or kind of understood the wedding process. Uh, Any last words? Uh, No, I just always want to thank you guys for listening and taking the time to listen. And once again, I thought this podcast was a really good one. Learned a lot of stuff. Obviously, you know, not in the wedding scene like that. Julian's not in the wedding scene like that. So I think it was overall really beneficial and uh, catch you guys later.